welcome to another episode with Rethinking Trauma and Transition. And tonight or today, we are going to be continuing on with the theme that we started with PTSD, where now we're breaking it down into the key specific elements within that that people might have experience of, just to give a bit more of an in-depth review of that. And this episode, we're talking about hyperarousal, um, what it is, how it's experienced, and the key component elements within that. Does that cover it, Rich? What do you reckon? Pretty much, Ali, I think. So hyper when hyper arousal, then? Yeah. Um, if somebody that? imagines their central nervous system as, as a river, and when it's flowing nice and smoothly, there's no breaking of the banks, river banks. Yeah. But when there's a strong... Um, current come through or excess water coming through it's almost breaching that water or well, that water is almost breaching the river banks yeah so with hyperarousal it's getting to the limit of the of those river banks not quite flooding it over but just staying there just almost possibly sometimes encroaching over but staying within that river system itself so In terms of that, what would be the difference if the if if it wasn't staying within the realms of the riverbanks? If it was, if it was out of control, I'm. Yeah, so if it breaches the riverbanks, that's just flooding that land up beyond. Mm -hmm. So that would be considered then probably going into like a post traumatic stress sort of area where the holes surrounding area the whole body if you want is flooded where with hyper arousal it's just kind of contained within the river system but not so that's almost a bit like um, the expansion onto floodplains but not quite to the point where it's it's almost like so overwhelmed that, that everything stops functioning properly yeah yeah but the current is in hyper arousal the current is permanent there's no leeway of going Oh right, yeah. There's a dam up river, or there's a blockage up river, and that's going to slow that current going through that river. That river. Or so can we talk it. about hyper arousal, Rich? Mm -hmm. What What are the key parts of that 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 we might see? Because that's hyper arousal is quite is almost like a blanket term for a cluster of symptoms, isn't it? Yeah. So what are the symptoms? So we're looking at hypervigilance, mm -hmm. and that can be thought of as if somebody's gone away on operational tour, so the usual ones people would be talking about is um, when they're out on foot patrol or vehicle patrol. So why is a window open, for argument's sake, when all the other windows are closed? Why is a particular part of the ground maybe wetter when it's dry, when the rest of the um, this dirt track is dry? So it's looking for things that are out of place. And it's just then really tuning up very, very focused and just tuning into that environment that you're around, noticing as best you can all those little difference, all those little changes that are going, going on around you. So out in that theatre, out in that operational area, that's all really good and useful. But when you're coming back home, that hyper arousal, sorry, that hyper vigilance hasn't left. You're still looking around and go, what is that out of place? What is that doing there? What's that doing? It's almost verging on um, paranoia. But not really quite there yet. Okay, so would that be um, because picking up on on some of the conversations we've had before, where we've we've almost talked about or we have talked about the the experiences within PTSD as being almost plants in the wrong place, mm -hmm. things and experiences that in other circumstances some of these experiences are extremely useful. They're essential even hypervigilance being one of those because you know what you're describing is that heightened state of alertness which ensures that from from a sensory input piece you're really attuned and really focused on absolutely all of the the visual verbal auditory cues around about mm -hmm. you the kinesthetics around about you that says I, actually i'm going to notice anything that's out of place that could then be an indication that I need to take evasive action or do something that that 
out of the normal because this mm -hmm. is now a danger situation. So that sounds as though if you're transferring from from suppose say being on tour to to then being back in in your home environment, if that hypervigilance has been sustained for a long period of time, does it almost become habitual, almost like second nature? Yeah, it just can't, wants to look at the threat. So that means that not only are you, you're almost kind of, when you come back into that that home environment, then you're almost fighting against unconscious competence in something, mm -hmm. which would be that hypervigilance. Yeah, yeah. so that's what habit is, isn't it? It's yeah. that experience from conscious competence to unconscious competence, but you don't have to think about it too much. You just do it. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that, that's quite hard to turn off, isn't it? And to re and reform those thinking patterns into they're not needed in this environment is because they're more safer at home than obviously being away on tour somewhere. Well, that sounds a bit like um, like an encroachment of boundaries mm -hmm. in a way because there isn't that separation or comp compartmentalising between between um being on tour and being at home there's almost like a bleeding through and a and a tainting of one with the other yeah in terms of those habits those um reactions reactions mm -hmm. but what also strikes me is having had a couple of convers well, quite a few conversations with with people experiencing hypervigilance and this is going to be really interesting in terms of your take in this rich because Often what I, I'm, I'm told and what people describe to me is situations where maybe they're in a social setting, the hypervigilance kicks in because that habitual behaviour of looking and trying to do the threat assessment all the time is there. But the problem is, is because you can't identify the threat, then what that does is cause almost a cycling of increasing levels mm -hmm. of anxiety. Yep. So what would alleviate that? Because sometimes, sometimes I've had, I've actually, the way I've described it and 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 had the conversation has almost been, is the threat identification actually a part of the anxiety alleviation? It actually helps alleviate the anxiety if you can identify the threat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, will do. Yeah, because you're recognizing something there, and you're able to deal with it, aren't you? Because you know there's that threat is present um and if a threat isn't present and you're feeling anxious or you're looking for something that isn't there then all those that cortisol that adrenaline and all that sort of stuff will be still in the system it hasn't got anywhere to go so that so that identification of the threat is almost like the venting of those of those, mm -hmm. those cortisol levels the adrenaline levels yeah. that that is that like a reset then for the body system yeah, yeah. So that allows those levels then to dip and reset to normal and then the cycle then to restart. Mm -hmm. But if you haven't identified the threat, you haven't made um, decisions over how you're going to respond, then those levels haven't been reset. Yes. They just continue to escalate. Just continue. Unless that person then takes some action in some sort of way. So what yeah. sort of actions would that that be? Well, ultimately, if it's insane above whatever, it could end up in a fight, get thrown out, um, you know, violent or angry outbursts towards people and possibly domestic violence. So is that where, I suppose, at the lower end of the risk, there is the, the, the I suppose, the social avoidance, where maybe you would mm -hmm. To, to exit the situation and remove yourself from that yes. situation. But that would then potentially have repercussions for your family circles, the relationships you're in when you're not participating as fully in those social events. Yep. Could that be that, for instance, even if you're at the social events, then you might find that you'll find yourself a quiet corner or a room where there's very little people there, so you're almost, again, self-isolating within that social setting? Yeah, I've done that. 
I've done exactly that. I've took myself out of a situation just to get some just to get some air. Mm-hmm. Um and just didn't want to deal with what was going on around me at the time. Mm-hmm. Because it just feels like you're trapped within whatever it is in that setting. And there's no escape to then start feeling all these body sensations, heart rate, breath, and all that and go, I've got to get out of here. Or or I'll have to do something else. Something so, that isn't probably as healthy. Yeah, so that hypervigilance kicks in. Your heart rate escalates, breathing escalates. You might find that you get um, heat rushes to your skin because that's that's the blood flowing to your muscle mm-hmm. groupings to prepare you for fight, flight, freeze. Yeah. You've got all of those elements. You might find that you've got um, that anxious feeling in the pit of your stomach. You might have tremors. You might have, maybe maybe you might have um, like sweats, etc. All of which are part and parcel of those those cortisol and heightened adrenal levels. And then you've got that point where you have to then find a way to reset those levels because you know you can't sustain them because mm-hmm. they're just rising and rising and rising. Yeah, well, if it's in the pub, then you just get more and more, have more and more drinks, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's one way, but as you say, that means at a, a lower level, that means the isolated reactions. Yeah. At that it's opposite not... end of that scale, though? Yeah, obviously, it's not a healthy way to... Um get deal with that situation no and as you rightly see at the opposite end of that scale or the anger outburst you might find mm-hmm. yourself taking a fight because actually your body's pushing for that release of that adrenal that cortisol levels you know it's pushing you to action and it doesn't really matter at that point what the action is as long as you've got that vent for these for these emotions because these aren't meant to be sustained for long periods of time no and if this is in a private domestic setting, that might very well be where you instigate arguments with your partner, family members, and worst case scenario, yes, it can fall over into into situations where maybe there's domestic violence as well. Yeah, well, the original or why anxiety came about and why people are more cautious in general is because going back to the days of the cavemen and that kind of thing is. The more cautious would wait and see what was in the bush, what was that, what kept that bush rustling or whatever's going on. Um, and the less cautious, the more brave or the more people had something to prove more, would just go ahead in run first into that bush, whatever it is, and they may not come out alive. So I suppose it's the um this is the zebras and lions principle, isn't it? Mm-hmm. You've got zebras in the plains, and what they're they're doing is they're assessing the long grass for signs of predators, and, yeah. and all the time they're in they're in alert. But I suppose I'm going to use that analogy because I, that's a really nice analogy to bring it back to the military mindset discussion we were having, mm-hmm. and the difference and the anxiety that sometimes that has when you're no longer surrounded by other military members of your of your unit, your platoon, your 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 team, you're now on your own. So you're a single zebra on the plane looking for the line in the long grass. Mm-hmm. Whereas before you would all take turns being an alert, checking the checking the, the, the tall grass. Or you could say we are we're the lions and we're hunting for the prey. You could depending on what the mission is. Uh, depending on what the mission is the point is though is that there's nobody else there to alleviate that, that yeah, alert. There's, there's no, no, yeah if there's nobody else around you who's served potentially who's going to back you up who's got you six yeah there's nobody else there that you yeah. can trust to keep an eye on the surroundings that will diffuse that responsibility and diffuse the level of anxiety mm-hmm. because you know it's not just you somebody else is also doing the same so in terms of that though then we've talked about some of the coping mechanisms that 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 are used in terms of helping control that hypervigilance such as that isolation you know finding the quiet part of the room or the social setting you know maybe there's the that's where you suddenly find yourself maybe in the kitchen or in the back of the garden because you're away from the bulk of the grouping but I was just wondering if what might be quite useful is also um, 
do 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 you think people know how to spot when their partner or when their colleague or when a loved one is starting to 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 get into that hyper vigilant cycle? Oh, excuse me. I think it could depend on how tuned in they are to each other, mm -hmm. um, and maybe how long they've been going out. Mm -hmm. Some people are very good at reading body language, mm -hmm. maybe because of what was happening in their own personal childhood. Mm -hmm. Where others might be not as oblivious or don't care as much. Then I again that would depend on how how healthy that relationship is between those people. Mm -hmm. So what would you suggest that that you would be on the lookout for, in terms of what would and what would be the indicators that actually your partner's starting to feel uncomfortable, anxiety levels are starting to rise, and this might be something that we're we're actually. If you've had the conversation before, you can start to start to intervene or support mm -hmm. in terms of, of helping bring those levels down. So that could be how they're breathing, mm -hmm. how they're moving. So their head moving around a lot, looking, scanning for the exits, entrances, access, egress points. Mm -hmm. um, they could be looking for threats as well. Who's out and about. Um, so would that be, for instance, maybe... And if, if they're physically... Sorry, Ali, if they're physically close to one another, it could be tension in the body as well, where it was a bit more, where they were a bit more relaxed. Mm -hmm. So would that be where um, you could literally see somebody constantly scanning the surroundings so that they're actually, so they're almost literally doing that peripheral scan all the time, the eyes are constantly on yeah. the go, constantly mm -hmm. assessing, constantly watching. And as they do, that might mean that they're, they may be slightly distracted from the conversation they're having with you um, because their, their, their attention or focus is split. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as we talked about in the last one, you know, we get the tunnel vision and the auditory exclusion. You're just getting then hyper-focused on what's going on around mm -hmm. and getting ready for a situation that may that's possibly never going to happen. So if you were to give someone advice in terms of how would you help somebody to de-escalate those experiences, what would you advise? Get them to start breathing properly. Um, get them to sit down. If Well, somewhere it's um, reasonable for them to sit down potentially. Mm -hmm. Would you change the location? Yeah, you could do. Yeah. Get them to walk away from where they are into somewhere they're more comfortable uh -huh. and would that also be where you could almost have that if you if you're aware that you're that you're that, that a member of your circle has has this experience from time to time is that something that would be worth maybe having a conversation with them about to see actually when this happens what will help Mm -hmm. yeah definitely there's um distraction techniques we mentioned previously so i can't remember if we covered this or not but if you can get someone to look around and then focus on a singular point whether that is if they're outside it might be a tree might and then just focus on the tree look at the branches look at a leaf just re-examine where that all goes or it could be if they're in more of an urban setting might be a lamppost they could just start looking at lamppost cover. Where does that lamppost go? Where's the wiring go? What, et cetera, et cetera. Just really to get their head to move around. And as I say, it's to massage the vagus nerve and all that kind of thing. And for about 10 seconds or so, it's just distracting, get that mind away from what's going on somewhere else, bring themselves back into their body. So would that be almost picking something that you could then get them to engage with yes. rather than the scanning? So yeah. that you're actually helping them find that point of focus, that point of engagement, so that so that, that the other symptoms will start to alleviate and reset then. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that could be, for instance, maybe picking something that you could then strike a, a conversation about or engage them with so that there's maybe a, a, a focal point within mm. the environment that you can then structure the conversation about, which yeah. which starts to settle the the scanning. Yeah but also engages and distracts at the same time. Or if, well, I'm sure there'd be plenty of um, things to be examining and looking at, 
that partner could start doing pacing and leading with breathing. Mm -hmm. So pacing is breathing how they are at their rate, then leading them into a slower breath rate. So literally matching matching their breathing pattern yeah. to to the, the the person they're with, and then once it's matched, mm -hmm. then gradually starting to, to change that to bring that and de-escalate and bring that yeah. down. Yeah, very much so. Mm -hmm. So, the other thing I was thinking about, Rich, was um, that there's almost that conversation sometimes if you know that this is something that 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 someone is struggling with is that almost where it's is worthwhile having that conversation that says what are the particular settings that you think mm -hmm. yeah it would be yeah, definitely worthwhile so that you can almost strategize and have a plan in terms of of how that will be coped with what you would mm -hmm. need to put in place or, or 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 the awareness in terms of how you will help assist with that yeah so i suppose a classic could be things like um sports days or fireworks displays yeah Definitely, yeah. Well, sports days and fireworks displays, that gives somebody plenty of room to be able to move away. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe put some headphones in, play some quiet, quiet music or whatever they're into. But I certainly know from the conversations that, that I've had with people that probably those are two of the hardest and probably more intense situations or events that are filled with possible triggers. Mm -hmm. massive massively filled with, with possible triggers that are going to trigger all sorts of experiences maybe some of the flashbacks we we're talking about previously and also the hyper vigils yeah definitely have you got any um suggestions ali on how people can cope well i think um it's about being realistic in terms of your expectations of that individual so that if you're aware that these situations are particularly fraught and difficult for them then actually have that conversation up front to say, okay, so that you you've got an agreement over over what happens if they if they they aren't if they do need to exit the situation, how you're going to enable that for them so that they don't feel awkward with that too, and you're aware of the fact so that so that you don't feel let down either, and yeah. that's also maybe if there are, for instance, if this is a family setting, their children involved, maybe maybe almost. Almost engaging the plan with the children, but in such a way, not so that they're aware that there's an issue, but just so that they're aware that there might be a limitation in terms of how much this individual will, will be with them at that point in time. Because if you're if you're almost planting that seed in advance, then you're preventing the letdown because it's planned for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good plan. Um, yeah. And... The children are very aware of what's going on anyway, aren't they? In, a, in family situations, yes, they can be. I think children are remarkably astute and remarkably mm -hmm. observant, um, sometimes much more so than we give them credit for. And I think that's where my advice has always been to, to manage those expectations realistically because that avoids any issues. And it also means that, that well, you, you don't have to go into the, the full nuts and bolts of what's going on, but you you can position it so that there are exits without letdown that you've that you've planted the seeds for. Yeah, yeah. And we did briefly mention about um with hyperarousal is high risk behaviours. Yeah. Yeah. And give me some examples of those, Rich. So we mentioned earlier it would be buying houses that you can't or financing things you can't really afford mm -hmm. um unprotected sex with lots of partners mm -hmm. uh, driving fast around in motorbikes or cars that those sort of behaviors i have high high risk behaviors right? is that what you're telling me oh definitely Ali. yeah yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and so how do people recognize they're doing that thing as in from a hyper arousal state and any tips on how they could deal with that well again what often goes hand in hand with that is that almost sense of pressure and sense of need to vent 
so mm-hmm. that so that there is a release that you're 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 chasing in that moment. Um, you may well find that while you you you're not necessarily experiencing, um, what we would almost class as an as, as an anxiety attack, it won't be wrapped up in the same way that it would be if you're in in that hypervigilant state. However, the actual core elements of that anxious experience are probably still going to be there. There's probably going to be that sense of building pressure that you're looking to vent. There's probably um, a sense of um, anticipatory dread that goes yeah. with that, where again, you're looking for the vent and the ease of that experience. And because sometimes those high risk behaviours, it's the it's the outburst of the adrenaline and the cortisol, but there's also the dopamine hit afterwards, which then starts to level that down, which which acts as that counterbalance to it. Mm-hmm. Um, Could you explain um, an anticipatory dread, please, Ali? What do you mean by that? Well, the anticipatory dread is not being able to quantify what it is you're necessarily dreading, but just knowing that the sensation of something bad's going to happen is increasing. Mm-hmm. And it's almost it's a bit like having a sense that there is something that is really bad that's going to happen. You don't know what the really bad thing is, but you know that it's, it's pending and it's getting closer and closer. And as it as that feeling grows, the sense of the the timeline towards that gets shorter, but you still don't know what the actual event is going to be. Yeah. So you have the sensation of the dread, but you have nothing to pin it to. Mm-hmm. And then again, what that will do then do is put you into that heightened state of arousal because you can't identify a possible response to that. You just know that something really shitty is about to happen, but you don't know what. Mm-hmm. The hypervigilance will kick in, the avoidance will kick in, that need to... to remove yourself from the situation will kick in all because of these 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 unidentified threats that you're now feeling as though are coming closer and closer towards you yeah so that's basically what you mentioned beforehand about um, anxiety future pacing and the infinite possibilities of something that's probably that's most likely never going to happen yeah because what well, I'm going to I'm going to take this opportunity to be um a bit descriptive in terms that there is a very clear difference between a panic attack and an anxiety attack. Mm-hmm. And now is a good time to talk about it because we are talking about future pacing and timelines of events. Because a panic attack is all about the here and now, an anxiety attack is about the future. A panic attack is where that anxiety has been rammed right into the present moment here and now, where now you are in imminent fear or threat of um, risk to yourself in the here and now. So you're no longer anticipating a threat in the future, you're experiencing it as if the threat is now, and the desire and the urge to act is now. It's not about doing that or anticipating the need to act in the future. It's the fact that you are for, or you're feeling that urge to act now, and if you do not, that it, it can get to the extent that you feel as though you, you're physically at threat, that you are going to come to imminent harm or hurt. Yeah. So panic is about here and now. Anxiety is about the future, mm-hmm. and that the the problem you have when you're when you're working in the future is the infinite possibilities. And I think I said in one of the previous podcasts, isn't it, where there is one past, there's one present, but there are infinite multitude of options in our future. And when we're trying to contingency plan for all of those, no wonder it puts us in overwhelm. Definitely. So is there anything else you think we want to cover off in terms of that hyper arousal, that hyper vigilance, the anxiety cycle? No, I think we've covered all of that. Yeah. Okay. And I'm just wondering, in terms of the next conversations we're going to be having, we're going to look at some of the, I suppose, the opposites maybe, aren't we? Which is that high- Yeah, hypoarousal, mm-hmm. which is a numbing um, and all the other sort of stuff that goes along with it. So disassociation. And as we mentioned earlier, social di- withdrawal and isolation. And restrictive functioning. 
Yeah, and that, that hypo arousal is literally where you've got to that point of everything is now so so much that everything shuts down. Mm -hmm. it's, because it's, it's that flop response because we've talked about fight, flight, freeze. There's actually five. There's fight, flight, freeze, fawn, and flop. Yeah. And that, that hypo arousal is verging on that flop response emotionally is mm -hmm. and one last thing before we finish i think is remember all intentions all all behaviors have a positive outcome for that person very much i think that's about keeping in mind that this at some point served a very very necessary purpose mm -hmm. this was essential it's just now out of place yeah, And that comes back to that conversation at the very start of the episode tonight where we were talking about the, the, the intrusion of one part of your life into another and the fact that actually there's a lack of boundaries and compartmentalising there, which then means that it's almost kind of like a taint from one side to the other. And we can we'll talk about that when we talk more about I suppose some of the conversations we have with people that actually help move them beyond their experiences and into a point of recovery. Yep. Mm -hmm. So summing up then, Ali, we uh, talked about hypervigilance mm -hmm. and how that is looking out for things that are on tour really works very well, and then looking back coming back home, and then trying to find things that are out of place when they're not. Yeah, it's that constant threat assessment, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, um, anxiety and anger outbursts and how unhealthy they are and help and getting your partner or friends and family to help you when you're in those situations again to be aware of how they can help you cope better. Well, I think and I, I would I would stress the importance of that because so often part and parcel of these experiences are ones of isolation where you feel so alone in that experience. Mm -hmm. And actually what we're trying to do is say, is say, actually have the conversations, bring people into the experience, let them understand, educate them so that they don't see that as something that's really, really a major issue. But they understand that actually this is a response that you have mm -hmm. and there are certain things that they can do that will help you manage that response. Yeah. And have a plan as well. Plan. If you go into a restaurant, if you go into a sports day or if you're going to firework display something like that have a plan to say i need to get away from here for the time being let your friends know that actually there might be a reason why you need to stand in the, the back of the room with your with your back to the corner but that's okay it's not because you know you're trying to do anything other than actually make yourself feel feel less anxious and know that you're in control of the surrounding mm -hmm. circumstances share those little things with them that they might not otherwise be aware of but make quite a critical difference to you and to your experiences yeah and you never know that may be useful for that person as well it may well be they may be able to help somebody in their family or their another friend group they have well this is it and i think it happens so often when people start having these conversations and start sharing then i am always I'm actually, I'm not surprised when they come back and tell me, you'll never guess. I shared this with two of my friends and both of them opened up about their own experiences and it might not be about them, but it may be about somebody in their family. It might be about some another, another member of their friend circle where maybe the pennies dropped for them about something that's going on that suddenly something's made sense that they couldn't make sense of before or they're aware that there's somebody else that experiences something similar. And that's the power of that conversation. Mm -hmm. And these conversations need to be more calm and held. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you can find us on YouTube, Spotify, Anchor, and a whole host of other um, podcast channels. Yep, that you can indeed. Yes. Yeah. You can and, also find us on LinkedIn. Yep, and Facebook as well. Uh -huh. And soon to be our website as well. Yeah, awesome. And if you need to contact us, you can do so either through any of those social media platforms, so via Facebook, via LinkedIn, um, directly, you, you'll find both Rich and I directly on LinkedIn, you can message either one of us there, 
And we also have an email account, which you'll find at the bottom in the show notes for this as well. Yeah, awesome. Thank you, Ali. Thank you. And thank you to our listeners. And we'll hope you tune in again soon. That we shall. Yeah. Goodbye.